Hello, I'm Scott Sorrell here at the ADSA meetings, and we've been visiting with students and postdocs and researchers and the like, uh, talking about the research that they've done recently. Uh, with me is Susanna Reisenen. Uh, she's currently at the University of Helsinki. She's doing a postdoc there, but she uh, did her research at Penn State University. Suzanne, welcome to the Real Science Exchange. Thank you. Hey, would you mind giving us just kind of a brief overview of the research that you did while there at Penn State? Yeah, so my m main focus was on histidine requirements for lactate in dairy cows, and I also did some research with bioavailability of rumen protected amino acids, but mainly on histidine. Very well. Yeah. And with me, my co-host, Dr. Clay Zimmerman and Dr. Glenn Ains. Welcome. Good to be here, Scott, always. I'll let you guys dig into the data. All right. <laughs> Glenn, you want to start us out? Well, can you tell us a little bit uh, about your research? Yeah, so this particular research, we kind of combined all the histidine work that has been done so far. A lot of that work was done at Penn State University, uh, including my dissertation and PhD work. And um, in total, we were looking at uh, around 20 experiments overall published between 1999 and 2021, uh, more recent research. Um, some of the experiments uh, were done with uh, grass silage diets and some with corn silage diets. Um, and then we were, and also the, the way the histidine was supplied was both with rumen protected histidine, infused histidine in different ways. Um, and then we were testing, kind of simply just looking at the effect of histidine on supplementation on different production variables and then we also did some regression analysis looking at the, the kind of the how how the responses were related to uh, digestible histidine supply overall so how many of the studies were done with rumen protected histidine um, 12 12 of the uh, 20 so a little over half of them um, yeah did you see it, any difference in response between how the uh, histidine was supplied? We did um, for the milk true protein yield. There was a difference um, looking at the uh, histidine type. So with infused histidine, the response was greater or the magnitude of change with uh, increasing digestible histidine supply uh, compared with the rumen protected histidine. Both increased um, milk protein yield as the dose increased um, but more so for the infused histidine. And similarly also with the plasma histidine, we saw a difference there. And I think that's uh, partly due to the differences in bioavailability estimations for the rumen protected histidine. So it's a little bit trickier to have the exact dose. So probably we underestimate the dose from the rumen protected histidine. So what were the mean responses that you were seeing from a production standpoint with histidine supplementation? <laughs> Um, so for um, milk, milk yield, uh, energy corrected milk yield, it's um, I can't remember the exact numbers, but is it's around half a kilogram um, per day uh, what we saw, and and then for milk true protein yield, also the response was uh, around po uh, half a kilogram per day um, when supplemented compared to control. Yeah. So it's pretty solid data, I think, showing this effect of histidine and importance, especially for milk, milk protein yield. Does stage of lactation of these animals, does well, that play a role? So most of the experiments, I think, have been done with mid-lactation cows. So I, I don't know of any research done in transition cows, early lactation cows. Uh, so I, I think there is more work to be done there, for sure. Especially with, um, we know that there is a mobilization of histidine uh, during early lactation and histidine is an important part of the muscle tissue also. So there might be something there to look into. I noticed you called out the forages that you had yeah. in, the, in that research. Was yeah. that something that you were looking for or did you try to tease that data out? We haven't um, gotten there yet um, with the analysis, but we will. We want to look into it. Um, actually, histidine was found to be the first limiting amino acid like 20 years ago at my old, this current university in Finland, they did some yep. work with infused histidine and they were like the first showing that histidine could be limiting. Um, and, and this was done on, on grass silage based diets. Um, there aren't any work done with rumen protected histidine with grass silage, uh, which I, I, I hope to do in the future, <laughs> continue this work. Um, and they haven't done any work since uh, with histidine in, in Europe or with, with grass silage based diets. So I, I really want to explore that more. What type of grasses 
it's mainly Timothy, Timothy grass, Timothy. which is uh, highly digestible, uh, a lot of soluble fiber in the rumen. So I think that's in grass silage diets, I think it's specifically due to the dependence on microbial protein and that's why histidine probably becomes limiting in those diets. So in all these, these studies you evaluated, did mm. you did you look at potentially lysine and methionine as potential modulators of a response to histidine? Yeah, we, we have the data. Um, that's also something we are still kind of running the different analysis and figuring out what to include in the model and uh, what relationships to look into. But that that's definitely one important thing is to look at the, I think we will go for like efficiency of utilization of, of different amino acids, essential amino acids, including methionine and lysine, and then looking into how the response varied depending on their efficiency uh, in terms of histidine efficiency sure. and supply. Yeah, and it's important not to forget these other amino acids because, Absolutely. you know, it's not just one thing that's limiting, but we have to look at the profile of amino acids. <laughs> so I had a, a question about the, you showed the, uh, the responses to infused versus the responses to the RP fed. Yeah. Is there anything you can, can you calculate out of that or estimate out of there what the bioavailability actually would be for the, the yeah. RP lysine? Yeah, and I think that's something, um, uh, someone else also commented on this after my presentation, and I think it's it's a really important point and good point to. This is a good chance for me to look into the bioavailability estimations. There, the, some of the amino acids, rumen protected amino acids, are not the same between the experiments. So there might ah. be, I have to look into and go back and see uh, the estimations used in different experiments because it's like uh, in some of my experiments, I used my own estimations of bioavailability, and then others have used different. And that's also the whole another problem yeah. <laughs> or thing that we have to look into is the bioavailability, especially when figuring out. Uh, requirements of amino acids and then if we are using rumen protected amino acids but then we still are debating the bioavailability uh, bioavailability of these amino acids and how to measure it and then you know yeah absolutely. so it's it's I, a, bit, a little bit tricky but i think there is something there that i i could look into and see if i can you know correct for that uh, bioavailability estimations with the plasma data because you, you did try to estimate the digestible histidine yeah I did yeah. this was uh, one of like a separate trial that I did ah, um, okay yeah so that's that, that explains the yeah. answer to my question yes yeah. yes <laughs> yes so Susanna with you know with all the research that's been done now with the meta-analysis mm. is there enough information to um, estimate a requirement for histidine uh, this is a, always a tricky question if I if I want to set a, a you know grams per day requirement or not. But we have been looking into the efficiency of utilization, and with Dr. Lapierre, um, she's been estimating that. Um, and then I also did my own estimations in my uh, one of my or all my experiments, and it looks like it would be around point somewhere point seventy seven point eight. And based on the meta analysis I did looks like it's somewhere around 60 grams per day of digestible histidine uh, that's the data we we have and that um, and the meta-analysis is showing but of course we it depends on so many things so yeah i don't want to give you know uh, this type of recommendation um, but um, i think we do need some more data to to establish it and with different diets especially grass silage based diets low protein diets maybe it's different yeah so in in europe mm. If if a diet's deficient in histidine, how would you supplement it right now? It's very tricky because we they can't use um, blood meal, for example, which is a good source of histidine. Um, so uh, we I, we have done some work with faba bean, uh, and rapeseed meal actually has a pretty good histidine concentration. So. Um, uh, they are saying also that if we have uh, rapeseed meal or canola meal in the diets, they maybe are not that uh, deficient in histidine. Okay. So it depends on the diet and how how high in protein you want to be. Right. Yeah. But I want to be in, uh, I I want to be uh, you know low protein diets and then you you have to find a way to supplement histidine for sure. Suzanne, this has been a very interesting discussion. Uh, to kind of kind of summarize things, what are a couple things that the audience should take from your research? I think we, we we have to start thinking more about histidine, uh, included in the, the limiting amino acids with methionine and lysine. I think that's important, especially if we are driving toward lower protein diets overall. I think histidine is, is one of the three for sure to, to, to look into. And I, um, 
and I hope we we can um, start testing it with different different type of uh, basal diets and combining with with different basal diets. Very well. So uh, now that you're uh, back in well back in Europe at Helsinki, what kind of research are you doing now? Uh, we have been working on legume silages, red clover silage and um, baba bean, uh, both as a whole crop silage and protein concentrate. And they're actually, methionine is one of the limiting am amino acids in legumes. Okay. And that's what I've been working on, looking at uh, supplementing methionine on legume-based based diets. Yeah, very well. Well, listen, I want to thank you for joining us today. This has been a treat. Thank you. All right. Good luck thank to you. you very much. Thanks. Thank you. We'd love to hear your comments or ideas for topics and guests. So please reach out via email to anh.marketing at balchem.com with any suggestions and we'll work hard to add them to the schedule. Don't forget to leave a five-star rating on your way out. You can request your Real Science Exchange t-shirt in just a few easy steps. Just like or subscribe to the Real Science Exchange and send us a screenshot along with your address and t-shirt size to anh.marketing at balchem.com. Balchem's Real Science Lecture Series of webinars continues with ruminant-focused topics on the first Tuesday of every month, monogastric-focused topics on the second Tuesday of each month, and quarterly topics for the companion animal segment. Visit balchem.com slash real science to see the latest schedule and to register for upcoming webinars.